So, we, uh, this, all right. Mike, how are you doing? So, um, I suspect there may be some questions from the uh, people at the table, let, some responses. Let, what, it's hard to know how to respond to Neil ever, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. I, you know, the question that you asked about why 15% is, is, is disturbs me a little bit because this, this other presumption that that uh, you know scientists are somehow not people, and and that they don't have the same delusions and you know they're. How many of them are pedophiles in the National Academy of Sciences? I don't know. How many of them are Republicans? Uh, you know, uh, 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 um, uh, and so um, it would be amazing, of course, if if it, if it were zero. That would be the that would be the news story. Uh, it's, and but the point is, I don't think you'll expect uh, uh, any of them, in, uh, well, in general, to be to to have their religion, for them to view their religion as a bulwark against science or to view the need to fly into buildings or whatever, whatever the point is. So there are, I, I, the delusions or the predilections of individual scientists are important to recognize that scientists are people and, 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 and they're full, as full of delusions about every aspect of their life as everyone else. We all make up inventions so we can rationalize our existence and, our, and why we are who we are. But Lawrence, if you can't convert our colleagues, why do you have any hope you're going to convert the public? I don't think we have to convert those people. They're fine. They're, that's the point. They're doing science. They're, they're no problem. That's why, why Bob, I don't understand why you need to do that. The, the figure is actually, I believe it's 7%, 7 percent, not 15%. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's even worse. <laughs> in terms. But, it, but it's in, in a way, it's sort of irrelevant, like you said, how many of them are also conservative or liberal. It, the, from a social scientist's point of view, it's just what are the different variables that go into somebody's belief system? Um, so at the end of my book, Why People Believe Weird Things, uh, the last chapter is called Why Smart People Believe Weird Things, which is the, the harder question to answer. And the short answer to that is because they're better at rationalizing beliefs they arrived at for non-smart reasons, which is to say most of the beliefs that most of us hold you arrive at because you were raised that way or you were influenced by peers or mentors or, um, or there, there's some psychological comfort to it or whatever. And, but because we live in the age of science, you're supposed to justify your beliefs. So you, you using the after-the-fact reasoning, you go back and look for reasons to justify it, and smart people are just better at that. And, and, and not just in religion, they're better at rationalizing why they're conservatives or liberals or whatever economic ideologies they support or whatever, across the board. And, uh, but, but really, the, the, from a social scientist's point of view, there's obviously a relationship between education and intelligence and religiosity. It goes down. It does. It absolutely goes down as education goes up. There's a reverse correlation. It's undeniable in study after study. And, um, and, and it's just one of many variables that you would, you would look at like that. So there's obviously something going on there that's meaningful. Mm. Uh, can I interject quickly that what we don't often see is the effect of your education level subtracted out of the effect of, having, of being a scientist in your likelihood of being religious. So in other words, we say, what's, we, we say this 40% figure for the nation's scientists, but we don't, and all scientists in that study have PhDs. So we have to ask what percentage of PhDs in any field are religious. That number is less than the figure for the general public. And so you're already sort of halfway there just by having the PhD in any field. And now you ask, what effect does being a scientist have on it? And it's a smaller effect than we're otherwise mm -hmm. giving it, granting it, if you don't otherwise cite the, 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 mm -hmm. the simply uh, the, the, the being educated effect. I think it was the engineers were the, of the scientists were the most likely to believe, wasn't it? Say? Yeah, and the mathematicians and, and were high up. biologists too. were the least likely yeah. to believe, yeah. yeah. Uh, another thing that was interesting in that poll was that, that physicians uh, were more likely than scientists. Sixty percent of U.S. physicians believe in a personal God. And I think that probably shouldn't be surprising simply because physicians are the people who have to tell people all day long that they're going to die uh, or they tell the family that, they, that, that, you know, that their uh, family member is going to die. And I think death is very much central to this uh, this, what is otherwise a quite a, an astonishing feature of our discourse that so many people believe the preposterous. I mean, there is no, there is no story that is going to so totally inure you to the, the tragedy of the death of your own child um, uh, better than the story that she has been taken up to be with Jesus again, and you, you're going you're gonna to see her in a few short years. Um, and so r r these religious myths are... are paying enormous dividends, emo emotional dividends for people. And I think it is the job of science to 
present a fully positive account of how, just how we can be happy and in this world and reconciled to our circumstance. One which, uh, you know, the, the alternative that religion is is essentially offering people in that situation is uh, the alternative to learning how to grieve. I mean, rather than learn how to grieve as children, uh, we learn how to uh, believe that death is, doesn't exist, um, or is in, in some cases a good thing, the best thing that could possibly happen to you as you get in this, this cult of martyrdom. Um, but what, one thing I think we should call attention to here is, is, is something that Michael brought up in his talk, is that there is, there's a difference between in a context like this, calling a spade a spade and really mm -hmm. calling delusion delusion and doing it across the board in every social situation where you become this boorish character who, you know, you get into an elevator and you see someone with a cross around her neck and you <laughs> lurch to toward her and try to take away Jesus in that moment. Um, this is not something that anyone, I think, is advocating. I'm, I'm, not, I'm probably one of the more strident people here, um, and I'm not advocating that. But... I think that even here we are suffering the, the, the taboos that, that I'm trying to call attention to, and I know Richard uh, quite eloquently and for many years has been calling attention to, um, the taboo around criticizing these esteemed religious myths. Uh, we can laugh at a belief in Zeus, but we can't laugh at a belief in Allah or the biblical God even here. And I just, I just want to... Um, point out that, I mean, our, our situation is so uncanny. I mean, we, we have a world that has been shattered by literature, and I think we have to marshal an, an emotional response that would, the same response we would have if we woke up in a world tomorrow where, you know, the, the, all the violence in the Middle East, all the bloodletting, all the wars and, and, and threat of future war was born of rival interpretations of the plays of Shakespeare, where, you know, the, the Jews like King Lear and the Muslims like Hamlet, and they're willing to blow themselves up in crowds of children <laughs> over the difference. Okay, that, that seems like an impossibly bizarre world to live in, and yet that is exactly the world we are living in. And if we could, if we could come face to face with that strangeness, uh, I think we wouldn't be wasting much time wondering about whether there is a conflict between religion and science. Um, one thing I'd like to do at this point, uh, uh, what the, 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 the idea at this point is um, uh, I would like to actually get some audience comments because I think we've gone on long enough. I think I see a lot of people looking there agitated, wanting to say something. So we could just take a few audience comments and then um, we'll have Steven Weinberg lead us into lunch, moving on to the If Not God Then What section, just a brief thing to think about over lunch. And then after lunch we'll come back with Joan, with Carolyn Porco, and a couple of others to go and discuss those issues. But I, I think it would be a good idea to get some, get some interaction from you all, because I think you've been sitting there wanting to say things for quite a while. So, Mazarin. Um, so it seems to me that, you know, you and we agree on what the problem is, but there Could seem you to be... Vi yourselves? Pardon me. Oh, I'm Mazarin Banaji uh, from the Department of Psychology at Harvard. Um, you, 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 you know, you, you all agree uh, on so many basic assumptions. Uh, where the differences lie, it seems to me, is in how we ought to treat those who think so differently from us. And so my question to you is, uh, given that there have been uh, ways in which propaganda machines have been set up in the past to convert large groups of people, and we've known how to do that effectively in certain parts of of, of uh, the world and not as well in others. Uh, is there something about the scientific agenda that sort of handicaps us in a particular way? In other words, if the Warren Buffett, uh, Bill Gates uh, Foundation were to give you the 30 billion that is now only half their endowment, what would you want to do with it uh, to bring about change in the manner in which you see it appropriate? Let, let me give you one quick answer. I mean, I spend a lot of time in the public arena now, uh, and, one of the, and scientists are particularly poor handicapped uh, because um, you don't deal with lies very easily. Uh, Randy, did a, the amazing Randy did a wonderful example of, you know, he, he had two assistants who, who uh, he got to go into a, a, um, a um, uh, ESP testing laboratory, and he said, you know, fool them. And uh, if anyone ever asks you if you're cheating, say, yeah, I'm cheating, I'm cheating. And, of course, the, the study came up with two wonderful ca examples of people at ESP. And, and the reason the scientists never, you, you presume that there's an honest discussion. And in the, in the, in the public domain, 
in the, in the domain of, of public relations and politics, uh, which is what a lot of this is involved with, vitally, um, you can't just assume that the truth is going to win out. It, it, you can't just assume, you know, when I pick up a physics journal, I, physics, physical review, I say, that's garbage, that's garbage, that's garbage. And a lot of it's garbage, but I don't spend my time writing articles saying it's garbage because I know it's going to fall by the wayside. But in the public domain, a lot of the garbage isn't going to fall by the wayside. You have to actively create a public relations campaign. You have to look, think about sound bites, and you have to become an evangelist. And that's very difficult, I think, for much of the scientific community to do. It's, it's not in their nature. And so I think um, it, it's, it is, there are inherent handicaps to combating certain well-funded groups whose, whose existence is based on, on public relations and manipulating the truth. Well, if I had half the $30 billion, <clears throat> I would call the United States every week from my island and and check in with the Skeptic Society and see how they're doing there. And uh, uh, although it's true, uh, Neil, we can't talk people out of their religious beliefs in, any more than we can talk them out of being conservative or liberal or, or, or any belief system they're behaviorally committed to. But we can offer something else and let them come to it in their own good time. I, I thought of an analogy of this just a couple of days ago in the, uh, I think it was in the LA Times calendar section or the, one of the variety. Uh, movie papers, they were running ads for all the uh, awards for the upcoming film festivals, and, and every one of them at the top says, for your consideration. And then, then there's the, the ad for the film and all the good things about the film. So in a way, uh, all the books that we write and uh, articles and so on, in, in a way it's saying, for your consideration. Here, think about this. Uh, Richard's idea of consciousness raising, um, it, it's not that... Uh, uh, we're going to convert people, but here's an alternative. Try, try it on. Uh, sometimes I'll say, just try being an atheist for you know an hour and see how it goes, and and you can always you know back off or try it for a day or something like that, and just see just see it how it goes. Uh, you, you can't force force it to happen, but it it can happen if if there's something available. So our job is just to make it available, something appealing. <laughs>